Hello everyone, this is um, part two of the presidency uh, video and um, in, in this one we're going to talk uh, a bit about the evolution and the politics of the presidency. In the, in the previous one we talked mainly about the institution of the presidency and how the president is elected, elected and so forth. And, and now I want to talk about how the office has changed over time, how it was originally designed. We've talked a bit about that. But how has it changed and how did we get to the point where we have the, the sort of presidency that we have today? So um, in the broad perspective is this, that when the nation was founded, and I'm speaking now of the um, our sort of second founding with the Constitution, not the Articles of Confederation, but the Constitution, 1787. When the nation was founded, the president was a bit like a chief clerk. That's what another political scientist named Theodore Lowy use the term the chief clerk as opposed to the chief executive because the executive branch at that time was actually very small we did not have this big bureaucracy that we have today at the federal level um, government was mainly done by the states the federal government had certain limited responsibilities um, foreign policy war etc and as we've talked about you know the constitution made the US government more powerful than it had been previously but uh, still, the executive branch was quite small, and Congress was responsible for making most of the decisions. Congress, uh, through its legislative function, was doing most of the governing, and that actually is the way the founders envisioned it at first. And, and the proof of that is that if you look at the presidents of the 1700s, the late 1700s, and all, the, all through the 1800s, what we call the 19th century, there were very few um, distinguished presidents. I mean, just if you just try to think of the great presidents of the 1800s, who would you come up with besides um, Abraham Lincoln, who, you know, who led the country during the Civil War? But other than that, really, most of these presidents were kind of undistinguished, you know, in the 1800s. But beginning with the Spanish-American War in 1898 and uh, throughout the 20th century, the U.S. rapidly became a major player in world politics, and that really changed the presidency because in our system, uh, the way uh, the Constitution is set up, um, the, the president really runs foreign policy. I mean, Congress basically can't run our foreign policy. You couldn't have 535 people doing it. Um, their role really is limited to ratifying treaties uh, more than anything. And uh, everything else really in foreign policy is the primary responsibility of the president. And so when the U.S. entered onto the world stage with the Spanish-American War, fighting one of the great old empires of the world, the Spanish Empire, um, the presidency suddenly became very powerful. Then we have World War I in uh, 1914 to 1918, World War II 1941 to 45. We come out of World War II a very, very powerful, the most powerful nation in the world, and so forth. Well, if, the, if we are active and powerful in world affairs, that means the president is at the center of things, because that's who has those foreign policy powers. So that's one thing that happened. The second thing that happened is that Congress uh, began to expand the executive branch. And this began right around the 1890s, but really took off in the 1930s under Franklin Roosevelt. Basically, Congress expanded the executive branch and put the president in charge of a whole lot of agencies uh, that were involved in managing an increasingly large and complex economy. Well, again, they gave power to the president. Congress made the president more powerful. And thirdly, the invention of mass media gave the president a huge advantage over Congress because the president can speak directly to the public, originally through radio and then through television and now through social media and all three of those, really. So the president connected personally with the population in ways that Congress couldn't. So all these three ways, um, Congress uh, took a second place to the president I know they're still important, but if if we ask yourself who do we turn to for for leadership in this country, it's the president, and this is why. So we're going to talk here about the development and expansion of presidential power, how the modern presidency was created, in large part through delegation of power. Remember, we talked about the four different kinds of powers, and we've uh, in the previous video, and we talked about enumerated, implied, and inherent. And now we're going to talk about the, the, the last delegation, powers that were delegated to the president by Congress. Um, and then we're going to talk about the personal president, that is the, the, the president who 
talks directly to the public in ways that Congress can't. Um, this really starts, the modern presidency begins um, with Franklin Roosevelt in the 1930s. Now, Congress did create a couple of agencies in the late 1800s. The Interstate Commerce Commission, for one, the Sherman Antitrust Act. There was some of this done, but it really took off in a big way um, with Franklin Roosevelt's presidency from 1933 to 1944. Why? The country, when he took office in 1933, he won the 1932 election and took office in early 33. The country had been in the worst depression in American history. It was a global depression called the Great Depression. It lasted for about 10 years. And he took a very active role in responding to the Great Depression. He proposed all kinds of programs. He took control over Congress. He even bullied the Supreme Court. And uh, and so for 10 years, he was viewed as the one person who was bringing the country out of the Depression, who was at least trying to. And then along, right at the very end of the Great Depression, World War II started in Europe in 1939, and in uh, the U.S. we entered it in 1941. So he, then he leads the country during World War II. So look at it, all those years, from 33 through his death in 44, he was the leader of the country, the leader, of the director of the economy, and the, 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 the leader of the country in wartime. And by the time that ended, the new mold had been created of the president as the primary um, policymaker, and director of the federal government, and Congress was was basically forever put in second place. Um, and he also created this mold of the president as sort of the personal president, the one who talks to you directly through radio, now TV, and social media, in ways that Congress certainly can't. Now, though, I want to explain to you how this delegation works, because this is a constitutional process that sometimes ends up in front of the Supreme Court. Um, what happened was, Congress essentially was delegating or giving power to the president and the executive branch in ways they had not done before. Um, it operates this way. They create a new agency of government, and then they put that agency where it has to be, which is the executive branch. And so who's in control of it? Ultimately, the president. And they set the president up as the person who nominates the head and the top officials of that agency and who gives them um, directions and tells them you know, how to function, proposes their budget, etc., most of these agencies had to do with two things. One was creating a social safety net for the country to help people who had fallen into poverty and couldn't get out of poverty and unemployment. And another part of it was to get the economy rolling again and to regulate business to prevent capitalism from completely collapsing. Uh, I've, and I've listed a number of the agencies here, the Agricultural Adjustment Administration, the FCC, the FDIC, the National Labor Relations Board, and on and on and on, many agencies. Uh, almost all of them still around in the present um, that, that regulate many different aspects of our economy. And, you know, Congress is normally, because they have the legislative power, Congress would be making the rules that these agencies actually make now. I mean, Congress delegated the power to legislate, essentially. They, they essentially gave away part of the legislative power to agencies in the executive branch. And the agencies make what we call rules, but those are actually laws. Now, and I'm going to explain to you how the, what the limits are in this, but the net effect of this is Congress was giving away a lot of its power to the executive branch and putting themselves in a supervisory role as opposed to a legislative role. Now, I'm not saying this is a bad thing, but it's a, it is a thing that made the presidency a lot more powerful because the president is now the one in charge of all these agencies. Um, now, this is, this is the way it works. So Congress passes a law creating a new agency, such as I most recent one, the Department of Homeland Security uh, in 2002, which was created after the 9-11 attacks. And they give the agency specific functions. But the, when they create it, it's in the executive branch. So the new agency is under the ultimate direction of the president, uh, staffing, budget, direction, etc., which makes the president a lot more powerful. And many of these agencies, like the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, the Environmental Protection Agency, and on and on. They make rules about whole areas of our economy, the workplace, the environment, and those rules have the force of law. 
Now, the federal courts uh, have had a lot to say about this, and they have concluded that they will allow this delegation as long as Congress supplies sufficient guidelines in the legislation when they create the agency so that the agency understands what Congress wants them to do and the limits of their power. Now, sometimes people say the delegation has gone too far. Um, there have, uh, they, they use a thing called the intelligible principle test, the Supreme Court does. It comes from an old case where Congress has to lay down by legislative act an intelligible principle to which the person or body authorized is directed to conform. Now, another thing that Congress can do if they don't give enough of a principle, uh, the other problem, that would be one problem, if they don't explain exactly what the agency is supposed to do, so it's like Congress is still sort of in control of it. Um, that's one thing. If they don't do that, the Supreme Court can say, no, you, you, you can't delegate that way. You didn't tell the agency what they're supposed to do and how they're supposed to do it. But the other thing they can go wrong with is uh, infringing on state power. It's possible always for Congress to go too far. And, and uh, in, for example, there was a situation where, where with uh, background checks for buying firearms, Congress originally set up a system by which they ordered state officials to do the background checks. And the Supreme Court said, you can't do that. If you want to, if Congress wants to have background checks for buying, buying guns conducted, you have to do it yourself or set up some federal way to do it or work out arrangements, but you can't order the states to do it. Um, and the limit of this is something called the non-delegation doctrine. Uh, some people, particularly Republicans, uh, have taken the position that uh, the words in Article 1, Section 1, where all legislative powers are vested in Congress, means all, and, and that Congress can't delegate anything. But really, um, that is not a practical way to run the government at present. There's just been, these agencies are too much a part of our economy, and many of them actually were um, requested by the business community. The, uh, for example, a Securities and Exchange Commission regulates the stock market, and people in the stock market want it to be regulated. So I, I think um, this this is the non-delegation doctrine is maybe a, probably too literal an interpretation of the words. Um, now I mentioned uh, Roosevelt and his leadership uh, during World War II. Um, this has continued on to the present. And I'm going to talk more about this when we get to presidential job approval later on in this video. But take a look at what happened with President George H.W. Bush, who, who was elected president in 1988. So he served from 99 to uh, from 89, 1989 to 1993, when Bill Clinton defeated him after one term. Look at his approval ratings. He came in at about 51, and when when uh, Iraq invaded Kuwait, suddenly his job approval shot up. Why? The president is the commander-in-chief of the military. The president can respond to emergencies. The president runs our foreign policy. So in times of war or national emergency or crisis, the president becomes the center of attention, and usually that causes job approval of the president to shoot up, at least in the short term. Sometimes it's called the rally around the flag effect. Now we've got to get behind the president, you know. And also, it, again, it's the president acting as the strong leader who's protecting the country. So as soon as Iraq invaded Kuwait and caused a crisis, job approval of President Bush shot up. Um, and then there was a long dragged out period while we built up, but uh, in, in order to, to evict them basically from Kuwait. And when we, with other allies, invaded and kicked Saddam Hussein out of Kuwait, look what happened. Bush's job approval rating went to 89%. Why? He was a strong, successful military leader, and we were at war, our troops were in danger, and he handled it very well in the eyes of the public. But look what happened to his approval after that. Down, down, down. Why? Well, we had a recession, the war was over, and down, down, down. He went to 29%. He was defeated for re-election, and he got a little bump right at the end, which frequently happens as someone's leaving office. But uh, he was he was defeated by Bill Clinton even after having been you know, at uh, at the absolute heights of approval as as late as February of 1991. By November of 92, he was in the the ditch in job approval. So, you know, many things can drag down presidential approval, but crisis almost always causes it to go up. And he didn't get a crisis at the end. He got a crisis early on. Um, 
Now the president has other resources, and uh, besides besides the power delegated to to him or her, I'm just going to briefly talk about them. They include the vice president, the cabinet, the first lady, the executive office of the president, and the White House staff. These are all things that are under basically the president's uh, control, um, as as opposed to things that were delegated by Congress. These are like the president's own personal resources that they control. The vice president, vice presidents are chosen usually to help the president get elected. They call it balancing the ticket. How? Well, ideologically, if the president's conservative, they try to find someone more progressive or vice versa. Regional balance, if the president's from the south, they try to find someone from the north. Demographic balance, as we have with, uh, uh, have had with, with pres many presidents, such as, for example, President Biden choosing an African-American Asian woman. There's, that's a demographic balance, you know, to try to enhance the appeal of the ticket when they're running. And uh, vice presidents used to just do almost nothing. But increasingly, presidents have given them major responsibilities. And two, for example, would be Al Gore, Clinton's vice president. He, had, he gave him major responsibilities to reorganize the executive branch, and he had a lot to say about that. And Dick Cheney, uh, Bush, the original Bush's, uh, well, Bush, Bush 43, the second Bush vice president, almost certainly the most powerful vice president in history. He was making foreign policy, one of the major architects of the second invasion of Iraq, which was a catastrophe. Uh, one of the biggest foreign policy mistakes in American history was the, the invasion of Iraq in 2003. And uh, that was Dick Cheney, uh, was one of the architects of that. So Bush probably may wish that he had not given him quite so much authority. But Cheney had previously been Secretary of Defense during the first Iraq War. He knew a lot about the Middle East. He knew a lot about foreign policy, and Bush relied on him. But uh, Cheney, um, <clears throat> Cheney's uh, view was that we needed to invade Iraq, and it turned out to be a catastrophe. The cabinet is the heads of the federal agencies and executive departments. And look here, I mean, theoretically, the cabinet is very important. They get together, we have a cabinet meeting. But it depends on whether presidents want to meet with them or not. They don't necessarily, they often don't even call them together as a group. So they aren't really a group. I mean, I put them here as a resource because they could be. If president wants to sit down and talk with the cabinet as a group, they can do it. And they do have cabinet meetings occasionally. But it isn't really an important policymaking body as a group, although each of those individual um, department heads and agency heads might be powerful. But, the, but as a group, they often aren't. They could, but again, they could be if a president wanted to use them. The first lady, or you know, someday if we have a female president, it'll be the first whatever, it'll be a man. But the point is, the president's spouse, if they have one, can be a very important resource. Um, not only are they informal advisors, but because often they are, they just you know, have input. But they are often used for public relations. Um, they take on specific things having to do with health, education, um, diet, uh, reading, literacy, and many of them have been quite influential. Uh, Abigail Adams, uh, the John Adams' wife, Woodrow Wilson's wife, Edith, especially when he had a stroke and got um, kind of disabled, she became increasingly important. Eleanor Roosevelt was a very important person. She was uh, she had her own agenda of things she cared about. Under she was Franklin Roosevelt's. Uh, wife, and she was a very influential and much loved figure. And of course, Michelle Obama took on a number of initiatives when President Obama uh, was in office, and uh, she she became you know important um, ambassador for him in various ways or um, in various policy areas. Um, but then, this again, this depends on the president. You know, um, uh, tr when Trump was president, I don't think he had um, his uh, wife doing all that much. And uh, you know, it's it's a matter of individual relationships and the and the capabilities of of the uh, of the president's spouse. They may be able to handle certain things. Um, uh, president Biden's wife is a um, college professor and can deal with education initiatives. Bush forty three, his wife was a librarian. She got involved in literacy initiatives. It all depends on what they're interested in and what they're able to do. But these are potential resources. The executive office of the president very important. These um, these are these these things were mostly created or authorized one way or another by Congress. The National Security Council is an extremely important uh, foreign policy um, making 
body that the president meets with whenever they want. They can sometimes, in times of crisis, they'll meet with them every single day. The Council of Economic Advisors helps the president uh, formulate economic policy. The Office of Management and Budget works with the president on the budget. This is all within the office of the president. Um, the U.S. Trade Representative deals with, with, with trade and, and tariffs and things. And then we have these things called czars. Um, <laughs> czars are, uh, it, it's, a, it's a, not an official term. It is a colloquial term. It refers to independent advisors that presidents appoint on their own. They, they are not created by Congress to uh, provide either expertise or coordination of certain policy areas. So like, for example, um, if we have a pandemic, the president might find someone and just appoint them to be, quote, a czar, but they're really a, just an informal advisor. Um, but, but they can put them in charge of, or, uh, of coordinating activities of a number of different agencies, and their power derives from the president. It's because the president tells everyone, listen to this person and do what they say. They aren't actually written into the government, but they have the president's authority behind them. Uh, and then we have the White House staff. Uh, the ch most important is the president's chief of staff. That is a very powerful advisor. Why? Because this is the person who manages the White House and the people who work in the White House. And, if, and the chief of staff um, is the president's gatekeeper. You don't get to see the president unless the chief of staff lets you in. And so always be aware of the importance of the chief of staff. And all these resources that we've talked about plus the delegation, have helped the president to become um, basically our nation's chief policymaker. Uh, we, we, everyone, including Congress, looks to the president to figure out what our foreign policies ought to be, what our domestic policies, what our economic policies and social welfare policies. Um, and the president has the initiative in the budget process, which is very odd because budget bills are supposed to uh, start in the House of Representatives. Nonetheless, we look to the president to do that. And the other thing presidents do is they make policy without Congress by issuing what we call executive orders. And uh, I'll talk about that in just a second. But uh, when do presidents propose legislation? Well, often in the State of the Union address, um, they will state their legislative priorities. They will propose legislation. Usually they try to do it early in their term because they want it, it takes time to get things passed, important initiatives. So usually right after they elect, get elected, they have these priorities and they try to push for them. Um, it's obviously because they have to get through Congress, they need their party behind them. And when they don't, or even if they have just a few members of their party that are not helping them, um, it, can, it can disable their ability to get legislation passed because presidents need to work with legislative leaders, either preferably from their own party and ideally with some people from the other party, but that doesn't always work. So that's why you know presidents can often do whatever they want in foreign policy, but in domestic policy, it's not that way. They need Congress in domestic policy. Um, the budgetary process, we'll have more to say about that later, but uh, later in the course. But it begins with the Office of Management and Budget in the, in the Executive Office of the President in the White House. They, they propose a budget to Congress. I mean, why isn't it Congress's responsibility? Well, it used to be, but now everyone looks to the President to go first on the budget. Uh, that involves taxation and spending. And uh, in all cases, Presidents have to decide um, whether they want to try to um, have a balanced budget, which people always claim they want to aspire to, but we hardly ever have, whether they want to um, run budget deficits, um, and, and when, or sometimes they use the term revenue neutrality. What that means is when you propose one policy that's going to cost money, you offset it by uh, finding the money somewhere else or cutting something else from the budget. Um, but usually new programs are not revenue neutral. New, usually they cost additional money and the question is raised then, how will this get paid for? How are we going to pay for these programs? Well, presidents are supposed to sort that out when they propose these legislation. These le uh, legis legislative um, proposals cost money and presidents are supposed to figure out how they're going to get paid for. And that also involves uh, um, figuring out what to do with the budgets of all the different agencies of the federal government. Should they get more? Should they get less? That's what presidents begin when they start with the policy, um, with, the, with the, their proposed budgets every year. Now, let's talk a bit about executive orders. Uh, presidents 
can get around the need to have Congress pass legislation by using executive orders, where they command the executive branch, the people under them, to do certain things um, and issue just you know proclamations, orders, and expect compliance. Now, sometimes these are constitutional, sometimes they're not, but they don't involve Congress. And understand that an executive order can be rescinded by a subsequent president. That's not, you know, legislation's different. Once it's passed, it's passed. But executive orders can be rescinded. So here's some examples. The Emancipation Proclamation that freed three million enslaved people in the, in the Confederacy, that was um, an executive order. 1863, President Lincoln. Uh, Franklin Roosevelt, this is an infamous uh, executive order, ordered the internment of 120,000 Japanese and mostly Japanese Americans during World War II without, without trial, without even any individualized suspicion, just on the assumption that because they were Japanese ancestry or birth that we couldn't trust them. They were locked up, lost their property uh, in 1942 for the duration of the war, and that was an executive order. Uh, uh, President Truman in 1953 nationalized the steel industry because they had a strike. The workers went on strike. The steel industry was going to come to a halt. And he said, well, we're at war. We're in the Korean War. I'm nationalizing the steel industry. It's going to be run by federal officials. And the U.S. Supreme Court declared that unconstitutional. But, you know, presidents issue executive orders all the time. It's very common. Most of them are not controversial. Some are. But uh, they have the force of law at least during the term of that president, unless the Supreme Court or a lower court declares them unconstitutional. Another weird thing that has been happening is something called a signing statement. Uh, that's where a president signs a bill. He says, okay, I'll sign this. It'll become a law. But the president will say, I think some part of it is unconstitutional. and Or they'll say, I am going to interpret this part that I don't like differently than Congress says. And they basically say that, and they write it down. Um, <laughs> they're trying to influence how the law will be applied and interpreted, but the law was written by Congress, so how can they do that? It raises some real questions as to whether signing statements have any uh, validity or not. It has not really been resolved by the, the courts yet. Uh, it's an interesting question. It's an attempt by the president to have even more legislative power. And now let's talk for the rest of this presentation about the personal dimension of the presidency. You know, we always see this. You see up here President Biden's family and President Bush right after 9-11 going to ground zero, the Obama family, the Trump uh, family. Presidents put their families and their, um, their personalities out there for us, and it is a resource for them if, it's, if they're liked by many people. It is a resource. Um, it enhances their leadership. So their personality, their leadership, leadership style become important resources for them. Because if they can't get what they want from Congress, they can go directly to the public. They can talk directly to us over television. And that can be an effective strategy for the president. And they can build popular support. They can get the public to be angry at Congress. Uh, they can in, uh, be partisan at times. And we kind of measure the president's um, connection or strength or popularity using opinion polls, particularly the job approval rating, the question, you know, how good a job do you think the president is doing? And I'm going to show you some of that in a bit. But um, this is how presidents mobilize support for their initiatives sometimes. They go directly to the public. So we're going to talk a bit about this, presidential leadership and personality. What makes a president great or not so great? And uh, I'm going to go over something in particular with you, which is James David Barber's um, study of presidential character. Um, and, you know, many presidents have great leadership skills, great powers of persuasion. For, for example, I mentioned Abraham Lincoln, Franklin Roosevelt, um, and uh, Lyndon Johnson in the 1960s. He had been a senator for a long time. He's a very persuasive individual. They're not all that way. But here, here's how uh, it works. Here's a way to think about it. Early on, the uh, presidents of the 1800s, we're talking now about the 19th century, the 1800s, their power uh, as leaders derived from their ability to persuade the other elites. In other words, members of Congress primarily and, and the leaders within the executive branch. That's where the power came from. But 
FDR in the 1930s suddenly became this, what we, I'm calling, we're calling in political science, the personal president. And suddenly there's a second avenue. The president can try to influence the leaders of the house and the executive branch leaders, and even judges, by going to the public, talking to the public directly. And then, and we measure that, how well that's working by their job approval ratings and opinion polls. So this is another strategy that presidents have. I want to talk with you a bit about approval ratings. Uh, they're very important to, pres to presidents. Uh, they watch them very closely. Uh, we'll talk a bit about what they, what they signify. I mean, um, they're not necessarily rational. In other words, sometimes people think a president's doing a great job because of something that happened that they had no, no power to control at all. Um, and other times uh, they take the blame for things that they didn't do. But one thing that we tend to see is often, not always, but often job approval ratings tend to decline as the term progresses. They, they tend to be very high when presidents take office. They tend to be high in times of crisis or war, if it's short and successful, but they can go down over time. So now, you know, a, a president, and, and here's an example of how we look at it. This is from Real Clear Politics, which is a a site that aggregates a lot of different polls and averages them out. So this is the average of many, many different polls over time. Um, job, uh, Trump's job approval, which is the black line, was always low. From the moment he took office until he left, it was always low. Um, he was always sort of, um, you know, below 50%. And um, that's an unusual pattern. Usually presidents come in higher, but, you know, uh, Trump lost the uh, popular vote uh, both times that he ran, and uh, the uh, he, he was such a con conflictual president that he didn't really uh, try to uh, mobilize support from um, Democrats at all, and and so I I don't know that he had any way of getting it much higher or if he wanted to. Um, Biden's approval is a more typical one, which start high and then decline. That that has happened with a lot of presidents. So he started really high, but then you know all kinds of problems and economic issues and COVID and whatnot cause it to go down. Um, here we have uh, three presidents: uh, Barack Obama, Donald Trump, and Joe Biden, showing that pattern coming in. Except, well, Trump was always low, but. Uh, in the case of uh, Obama, is the blue line. It goes. He starts high, goes down, gradually comes up a bit. Uh, Biden's, as I just showed you, starts high, it, then it deteriorates. This is often happens. Why? Because uh, presidents start dealing with conflictual issues. There were some people like what they're doing and other people don't. And when they first start, everyone's kind of optimistic, hooray for the new president. But then over time, people become disaffected. They, there's certain things that a president does. Maybe someone in West Virginia doesn't like it. Maybe another thing, somebody in California doesn't like it. And uh, it could be ideological positions and so forth. So, you know, dealing with divisive issues causes job approval to go down, and then, but crisis brings it up. And now let's get into this whole question of uh, presidential character. James David Barber is a political scientist. Now this, you get the joke here, right? Presidential character. Here, there's a cartoon character, so little political science humor there. Um, James David Barber is a political scientist and he tried to systematically address the um, question of how does a president's personality affect their, their, uh, the way they in interact with their job. I mean, the key thing about the presidency is it's one person and it's an institution that is occupied by one person. The Congress is 435, the courts are hundreds of judges. And so one personality, one set of character traits, one emotional makeup is critical to the office. And so he said, how can we develop a systematic way to think about the role of personality in the presidency? So he says, personality shapes presidential behavior. A president's personality is best understood as a pattern, including three things, their character, their worldview, and their style, their manner of doing things. Um, and then you have, he says you also have to consider the power situation and the expectation. So, for example, if a president comes into office and their party controls both houses of Congress, well, that's good. That's a good power situation. But they might come in and one or both houses is controlled by the other party. And then they can't get cooperation. So you see, 
it's not just their personality, it's also the power situation. But he says, to try to understand or predict what presidents are going to do, we have to understand their life from childhood to their first political successes. And the most important thing to understand is a, he has a type huh? So here are the three things, style, worldview, and character. Style, what does that mean? Um, that, that is something that you acquire in early adulthood. It's, it's how you act. It's your, you're developing a style now. All of us have it. How do we talk? How we deal with people? How we do our homework and our jobs? You know, these are the adult things as we become an adult. But before that, when we were adolescents, think about that. If you go back, before that you acquired, we all acquired, a worldview where you start to think and you're a, a teenager probably about um, are people good or bad? Do I like people? Do I like to be alone? Uh, what are the big things that are going on in my in the world right now? Like for example when when I was um, in high school well, we were getting into the Vietnam War and so that was one of the essential conflicts and issues of our time. For other people later, I think you know for people who are maybe in their in the 30s they're thinking about 9-11 and and there are other things you you know your generation will always be the generation that was coming to adulthood during covid you know these are these are big issues uh that that probably shape a lot of a, our worldview but even before that is what he calls character your basic character that you acquired as a child that we all do and he says the most important thing is self-esteem so Start like an onion, you know, at the beginning when you're a child, you, you start to form your character and, and your self-esteem. Then you go into adolescence, you develop a worldview, and then you become an adult and you start learning how to conduct yourself, how you do things. So he says, Barbara says, that um, this whole process that we're talking about here of evolving from a character, um, you know, and, and your worldview and your style, presidents do the same thing. And what this leads to is an interaction between a president's level of energy, how much, how hard they're working, and how they feel about the job. And I'm going to show you what this means in a minute. But basically, presidents who have high self-esteem can often enjoy politics. They enjoy the process. They enjoy the give and take. But presidents with low self-esteem are often looking to be liked or to get power over other people. And they do not make the best presidents. The best presidents are the ones usually who, who enjoy politics and who enjoy being leaders. The ones who just want power over other people, who are paranoid or have low self-esteem or are compensating, using, they can misuse the office. Uh, and, he, and he points out that some presidents are very active and engaged with the job and others are kind of passive and disengaged. And this produces four kinds of presidents. I look across the top. Active presidents can be active, high energy, or passive. Now, it's quite possible to be president and just let other people do most of the things. Or you can take a lot of initiative. And then down the left side, how do you feel about it? Positive or negative? So an active positive president is the one who is very active, working very hard, heavily engaged with the job, and enjoying it. So the active positive president, those are the ones that Barbara says are probably the best chief executives. Now look at the bottom right. The passive negative president, the, the passive negative president is the one who isn't a politician, who doesn't like politics, and who is unhappy. But then there's two other kinds. Passive positive is the president who doesn't do very much, but delegates a lot of power to others and is actually quite happy. Feels like, well, everything's fine. I'm letting other people do it, do the work. I'm supervising. I'm in charge. I'm at the top, and I don't have to do very much. And then we have the active negative, the most dangerous kind of president, the president who works very, very hard, but has but is not happy, is paranoid, is mistrustful, feels they have to compensate for inferiority, doesn't trust the people around them. They are probably the worst presidents. So let's think about some of these people. Um, Barber groups them this way, and I'm going to kind of use his grouping. You don't have to agree with this, but it's it's the way he kind of takes it. Active positive presidents, Franklin Roosevelt, John Kennedy, Harry Truman. Truman had a sign on his desk. It said, the buck stops here. And that is an old expression, the buck. It means the responsibility stops here. In other words, I don't pass along the responsibility. If something needs to be done, I do it. I like making decisions. I mean, he ordered the dropping of nuclear weapons on Hiroshima and Nagasaki in World War II and never agonized over it. 
And many people would never be able to sleep at night after doing a thing. Did I do the right thing? He didn't care. He made a decision and moved on. I don't know. I mean, that's... I doubt that, you know, many presidents would be able to do it that way, but that's what he did. And under Barber's scheme, that makes him an active, positive president. Um, the passive, negative presidents, the ones who don't do that much, George Washington, um, Calvin Coolidge, arguably Dwight Eisenhower, although many people disagree with that, uh, so that he was not so passive. But the passive positive, that's the president who... Oh, and by the way, um, the passive negative president means usually the person who really isn't a politician and doesn't want to be president, really. Washington repeatedly said he didn't want to be president, <laughs> but he's our first president and everyone said he did a good job, but he just he, he didn't really want to be president. He wanted to go back to his farm. Um, the passive positive president, be, well, best example, probably Ronald Reagan. Um, he was famous for not doing much, but he was quite happy. He enjoyed the ceremonial parts of the job, you know, giving speeches and stuff, but he didn't make many decisions. He actually had a very bizarre thing happen where his um, chief of staff and his um, one of his head economic officials, cabinet officials, wanted to change jobs, and he just let them do it. I mean, it's very unusual. He just said, oh, if you want to change jobs, go ahead. So that, that's kind of an unusual way, but that's the way Reagan was. He was passive, and he was very enthusiastic about uh, and thought he was a good president. And many people, other people think he was too. He just delegated a lot of authority. You know. But the active negative presidents, they are the ones who are probably the most dangerous. Um, and, and he puts LBJ in here, but LBJ, Lyndon Johnson in the 60s, was an active positive president in domestic policy, but active negative in foreign policy. He became heavily involved in the, prosecuting the war in Vietnam and it broke him as a president. He was micromanaging it and it was a failure. Uh, but he was a, a successful president in domestic policy. Richard Nixon was the classic active negative president, constantly paranoid uh, and worried about his political opponents, which is what led to his downfall, uh, where he had a, a team of people committing crimes on his behalf to try to keep him in office. What about recent presidents? Let's, let's think about them. Where do we put Obama? Uh, I, I think probably he would go in the active positive. He seemed quite enthusiastic about the job and, and was pretty involved, at least most of his administration. Uh, what about Donald Trump? Well, I, I think he goes in the active negative. Um, I mean, this is a guy who actually tried to subvert the election. He was so paranoid uh, about losing uh, a bitter, bitter loser and a very unhappy person. Um, Joe Biden, I'm not sure. Uh, you know, he, you could put him in one category or the other. Um, it, it probably, in, in some respects, uh, he's a bit of both. Um, he tries to be the active positive president, but, but um, at, 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 at times he may find himself at, in trouble, uh, unable to get things through Congress, which could lead to um, you know, a different approach that's more like the active negative. But this is a, brings to a, a close our uh, discussion of the presidency. And I, I really encourage you not to take my word for it on how to classify these presidents. You should think about it yourself. And, and the, ask yourself a question when election time rolls around and presidents are running for office. What kind of leader would they be and how would they fit into um, Barber's category? You may think that any one of these is the best type of president. Barber thinks active positive is the best, but maybe it's not. You know, And, and so this is something for you to decide on your own. But that concludes our presentation on the presidency.